In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, Good Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So during Mass, I spoke about the beautiful phases of the dawn, the white dawn representing St. Joseph in salvation history, the aurora, the beautiful spectacular colors that just take our breath away, being the birth, the Immaculate Conception and birth of Our Lady, uh, and of course, the sunrise, Jesus, the Son of Justice, who brings light and scatters the darkness. And what I'm going to uh, share with you tonight is that there are two views about this beautiful sunrise, which is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the birth of Christ. So there's one school that says if Adam and Eve had not sinned, there would be no Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. But there's another school called the Franciscan School, which I belong to, by the way. Franciscan School, which says that whether Adam and Eve sinned or didn't sin, God's plan was always Joseph, then Mary, then Jesus. The difference is that if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, we wouldn't have had clouds. It would have been all beautiful. There would have been no need for Jesus to die on the cross. There would not have been a need for seven swords to pierce our lady's heart. But Jesus and Mary would always, always have been king and queen. So I'm going to read to you a quote. There's a real fascination. There always has been, but especially today, a fascination with exorcism. It's in the movie theaters all the time, but especially this year, it's been a hot topic. And I'm going to read a quote from Father Gabriel Amorth, who was the exorcist in Rome for decades. And he wrote a book, which is translated into English, called An Exorcist Tells His Story. But what I want to read to you is a quote before he tells his story. He has to set the record straight. And this is what he writes. He calls these basic facts about God's plan for creation. And he says, all too often, we have the wrong concept of creation, and we take for granted the following wrong sequence of events. We believe that one day God created the angels, that he put them to the test, although we are not sure which test, and that as a result, we have the division among the angels and the demons. The angels were rewarded with heaven, and the demons were punished with hell. Then we believe that on another day, God created the universe and the minerals, the plants, the animals, and in the end, man. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve obeyed Satan and disobeyed God, thus they sinned. At this point, to save mankind, God decided to send his son. Now this should sound very familiar. This is what we're all used to. Adam and Eve sinned, therefore God sent Jesus to redeem us. And while that's true, it's not the whole story. Listen to what he says. I'm gonna be emphatic. This is not what the Bible teaches us. And it is not the teaching of the fathers. If this were so, the angels and creation would remain strangers to the mystery of Christ. He says, if we read the prologue of the Gospel of John and the two Christological hymns that open the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, we see that Christ is, quote, the firstborn of all creatures, end quote. Note that. He's the firstborn of all creatures. 
Everything was created for him and in expectation of him. There is no theological discussion, he says, that makes any sense if it asks whether Christ would have been born without the sin of Adam. Why is that? He says, Christ is the center of creation. All creatures, both heavenly, the angels, and earthly man, find in him their summation. On the other hand, we can, can, can affirm that given the sin of our forebears, Christ's coming assumed a particular role. He came as our Savior. He continues, the core of his action is contained within the Paschal mystery. Through the blood of his cross, he reconciles all things in the heavens, that's the angels, and on earth, man, to God. The, ev the role of every creature is dependent on this Christocentric understanding. So basically, if you remove sin from the picture, you're going to have two schools. Like we know that we know the economy of salvation with sin. Economy of salvation, there's God up here, there's man down here, and there's this barrier called sin that we created between God and man. And in order to shatter that barrier, Jesus and with and subordinate to him, Our Lady, the new Adam, the new Eve, had to shatter that barrier through the passion, death, and resurrection, and Our Lady through her sorrows. So we know that. But what was God's primary motive for the Incarnation? So if the primary motive of the Incarnation is to remedy sin, like a divine band-aid, so Jesus, if Jesus is the divine band-aid for our woes, that means if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, we would have a different economy of grace. It would just be God and us. No mediation, no Jesus, no Mary, no Joseph. And that's what, the, what we call the Thomists, those who follow St. Thomas Aquinas. That's their point of view, and it's also the view of many Protestants, etc. That the, the primary, even they'll say the exclusive reason for the Incarnation is to redeem man from sin. Whereas the Franciscan perspective is that there's God and there's man, but that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. In other words, even if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, all graces, from all eternity, God willed that all graces come to Adam and Eve, all the angels, all men, through the hearts of Jesus and Mary, the one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, and through Our Lady, our mother, the mediatrix of all graces. So this perspective, the Franciscan perspective, is that all of creation, all of salvation history, was always centered on Christ as our King and Mary as our Queen. Sin or no sin? No sin, there wouldn't be a need for the cross, but still Jesus and Mary. That's the Franciscan perspective. So what you end up having with the Thomas perspective, which is the perspective that Jesus just came to redeem us from sin, you basically have two, they, that school, the Thomistic school, is that there's two economies of grace. So the first economy of grace is, it's just the grace of God to the, the good angels and to Adam and Eve, just God and, and the creatures. Because of the fall, God has a plan B, which is to send the Redeemer. Uh, and so Jesus becomes the, the Redeemer, the Mediator, the King, because of the fall of Adam. So from this perspective, the Thomistic perspective, that everybody is pretty familiar with, all of the privileges of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, all of the privileges of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the privileges of St. Joseph, they would all be uh, contingent upon, they would all hinge on Adam's sin. If Adam hadn't sinned, there would be no incarnation, there would be no King of Glory, Mediator, 
there would be no queen mother, there would be no need for a guardian of the Holy Family. Uh, so that would have been God's primary plan, which is union with him without a mediation. The Franciscan scope is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, sin or no sin. So I hope that makes sense, just to, to get started, to get started. So why is this important? Um, to, to understand and grasp, I'm going to look at a few reasons why this is actually important in terms of our perspective and our spiritual life. First of all, the primary motive of the Incarnation, understanding that, it changes our perspective on God. Because it's a, that's a totally different perspective. Is the entire universe centered on Christ, God's masterpiece? Right? Jesus and Mary are God's creative masterpiece. Like, he could not have created anything more beautiful than the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These are his masterpieces. Capo lavoro, they would say in Italian. So, the capo lavoro, the, the masterpiece, the opus manus of God in creation, is the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Um, so, if that's the case, did God create, or will creation and salvation history in an intelligent, ordered way with Christ in mind as the chief cornerstone? With him in mind as his masterpiece, his king? Or did he will one economy of grace for angels, Adam and Eve, and then because of the fall, uh, he had another economy of grace in Christ for fallen man? So it affects our, what we think of God. Uh, it will affect also what we, how we view Jesus and Mary. So are God's two greatest creative works willed first before anything else is considered? In other words, did God think of Jesus and Mary, the most beautiful masterpiece of his creation, and then create the universe of angels and men and everything that's beautiful to serve our king and our queen? Or did he give priority to other things and then he used the masterpieces just to fix a problem? So Jesus and Mary become a remedy as opposed to being the centerpiece of all of God's creation. Obviously, the quote of Father Gabriel Amorth uh, draws out the fact that it, it, the primary motive of the Incarnation also affects our views uh, on the angels and the demons. So did God from all eternity predestine the good angels in and through and for Jesus, their mediator of grace and glory? Did God condemn the demons because they refused to serve Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, and his mother? Or are the angels that created apart from the mystery of the Incarnation, and therefore not really under the headship of Christ? Because, I mean, if Jesus came to redeem Adam's fall and to save fallen man, then the angels are really not under his headship as a God-man. They're under his headship because he's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the divinity, so that the two schools are different. So is Christ meant always to be the head of the entire body of Christ, and that through, with, and in him we are to give glory to God in the unity of the Holy Spirit, sin or no sin? Or uh, is Jesus that sort of plan B? So the, again, it affects the angels and the demons. And if you read Venerable Mother Mary Agrida, her mystical city of God, you will find, and St. Maximilian confirms this and many others, that the test of all the angels was that they were shown the mystery of the Incarnation, Jesus Christ, and his Immaculate Mother, and the angels saw that they were to be their king and queen, and that the, the bad angels refused. They said, non serviam, I will not serve someone with a lower nature than mine. They were proud and would not serve uh, God's mystery. So in, in the Franciscan perspective, all the angels, all the demons, all humans 
have to submit to Jesus Christ and receive grace and glory from him, sin or no sin. That's the perspective. And it also explains why, the, you remember the demons, how they knew Jesus. And then Jesus told, he would, he would tell them to be silent. And they, 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 were, they were mute. Like they couldn't tell the other demons who he was. Like they knew who he was. We know who you are. The demons knew because they had rejected him when they were uh, created at the beginning. It also affects our view of mankind. Think about this. Is the original dignity and sublime calling of man, Adam and Eve uh, in included, is that, that original dignity found in being elevated in Christ Jesus? A predestination before the foundations of the world in Christ Jesus to be God's adopted children? Were we always called to say, Abba, Father, in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit? Without any consideration of sin, was that always God's plan to have a family? Abba, Father, Mama Maria, and Jesus, our divine elder brother, our model, our king? Or is the dignity and predestination of the elect in Christ Jesus merely a consequence of original sin? You see the difference. There's a huge difference. I mean, like, the, the, beauty, the beauty is, well, let me, let me make one more point, and then I'll talk about this beauty. <laughs> it also affects our spiritual life. So if God willed from all eternity that man's spiritual journey be centered on the sacred heart of Jesus, the immaculate heart of Mary, sin or no sin, that changes our perspective. It's not just about sin. In other words, we were always called to participate in the divine life through the hearts of Jesus and Mary, if you follow the Franciscan perspective. And I think the fathers and the scriptures and a lot of saints, but there's also a lot of saints that on the other side, uh, whereas um, the other perspective, the spiritual perspective, is that the, the sweet journey of the saints to God through Jesus and Mary is the result of our need for redemption. So no sin, no Jesus and Mary. So because of sin, we have Jesus and Mary. That, that's the other perspective. So you kind of put this in a, a, a way that, that is very tangible. So... If you think of Jesus and Mary as the, the masterpiece of all of God's creative work, from all eternity, God willed the heart. He saw the hearts of Jesus and Mary. He willed the incarnation. He willed the divine maternity. And then he began to create all of the universe and all of the angels and us to be servants of Jesus and Mary, to love, adore God through, with, and in them. So is the, the, the dog wagging the tail or is the tail wagging the dog well i'm a franciscan Tog, dogs wag tails jesus and mary are the reason and we exist for them whereas the other perspective is the tail which is us sinners we cause the incarnation it's thanks to our sin that jesus had came in the flesh and is king of glory uh, at the right hand of the Father, so the heart of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, his human soul, all of those graces that he received in his humanity are thanks to our sin. And Mary, all of her privileges, her predestination to be the mother of God are all because of Adam's sin. Thank you, Adam, right? That's the perspective. So that perspective is the, the tail wagging the dog. Okay. I'm a Franciscan, I'm very biased. So, but, but you see where I'm going. Most people have never even heard this. They don't even know it's a discussion in theology. And that's why I'm here. I'm not telling you which way to go. I'll tell you which way I go, which way I think, and why. But you at least need to know about it. So I wanna point out that if you're interested, I have written a book on this topic I tried to make it so simple people like me could understand it, and hopefully you, if you're interested, it's five bucks for a book. They're over, over there, and there's a way to pay online so you don't have to write a check or leave five bucks. 
Uh, and if, if for some reason we sell out, which never happens, but if, and there's also some of my CDs, rosary CD, music CDs, um, but you can find it all also online. So there's a, my card over there with my website if you're interested. So I mentioned all of that. So I want to read some quotes, because I mentioned that uh, there are saints. So there's a, uh, he's considered a father of the church, uh, and his name is St. Maximus the Confessor. And he writes, I'm sure you're aware, St. Paul speaks of the mystery hidden from the past ages, but now revealed, and that that mystery is Christ, the Word made flesh, the incarnation. Jesus. He's the mystery that's revealed now in the fullness of time, he who was born of the Virgin Mary. And St. Maximus the Confessor writes, this is that great and hidden mystery. This is the blessed end for which all things were created. This is the divine purpose foreknown before the beginning of creation. Really, it was for the sake of Christ, that is the mystery of Christ, that all the ages and all the things of all the ages themselves received the beginning and end of existence in Christ. So this perspective is that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Alpha. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn of all creatures. He's the reason, the Alpha, the reason everything exists. He's the beginning. God starts with Jesus and his mother, and then he creates everything else in view of Jesus and Mary. And he's also the omega. He's the end. He's the last. He's the reason we exist. We're always pointed towards him. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's very true. It's not because of Adam's sin. Jesus was always at the center of God's plan from this Franciscan perspective. Doctor of the Church, St. Francis de Sales, he held this position, and you can read it in his treatise on divine love. He, he tells us that the primary reason for the incarnation was that God might communicate himself ad extra, which means outside of himself. That means creation. So the, the reason for the Incarnation was so that God could share his divinity, communicate his grace and glory outside himself. And so St. Francis de Sales points out that from all eternity, he saw that the most excellent way to do this was in, quote, uniting himself to some created nature in such sort that the creature might be engrafted and implanted in the divinity and become one single person with it, end quote. So this is why God willed the incarnation, so that united in the divine person of the word, you would have the divine nature and a human nature, and that through, with, and in him, we also, and the angels, could enter into this participation in the divine life. So in this scheme of things, Jesus and Mary are willed for their own sakes. They're an end in themselves. They are the masterpiece. God wills them because they're beautiful and give him glory. Whereas the other perspective, Jesus and Mary are willed for our sake, to remedy our sin, not for their own sakes. You see the difference? Both schools, this is what's beautiful, both schools you're open to follow whichever one you want. You know, if you want some counseling, you can see me afterwards. I'll be happy to direct you uh, in a certain direction. But the, the, they're both because the reason why they're both acceptable is because in the end, whether you're Thomist or Franciscan, in the end, all graces after the fall come to us through the cross of Jesus Christ, and we're all united. Like a Thomist and a Franciscan can both do the stations of the cross, <laughs> because after the fall. We aren't going to receive even a drop of grace except through the cross, the passion of Jesus Christ and the tears that Our Lady shed. So St. Francis de Sales says that through Christ and for his sake, God willed to pour out his goodness on other creatures, thus choosing to create men and angels to accompany his Son, to participate in his grace and glory, 
to adore and praise him forever. Another doctor of the church, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, uh, he writes, Therefore, God ordained from all eternity to communicate the infinite treasures of his goodness, to show forth the infinite charity of his mystery by this divine incarnation, in order that Christ might be great and might be or might sit as king at the right hand of God. A couple other quotes. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, Carmelite, mystic. She says in an ecstasy, if Adam had not sinned, the word would have become incarnate just the same. St. Bernardine of Siena, Franciscan, itinerant preacher, very devoted to the holy name of Jesus, very devoted to St. Joseph. Uh, he writes that uh, if Adam had sinned, yes, Christ had to become incarnate. And if he did not sin, he still had to become incarnate. Incarnate. Uh, by any, in any hypothesis, he had to become incarnate. Why? Because he was the centerpiece of all of God's creation. Sin or no sin? That's why God created. Um, I'll quote a Dominican, St. Albert the Great, doctor of the church. He was the professor, one of the professors anyway, of St. Thomas Aquinas. He held that this position was more in harmony with the piety of faith and writes, to the extent that I can offer my opinion, I believe that the Son of God would have become man even if there had been no sin. So we have a whole slew of these saints, even doctors of the church, who say this. Now I want to share um, just a little piece of information that many people aren't aware of, uh, and then I'll open this up for questions. But basically, um, one of the things that people don't realize is that traditionally we hold, or tra tradition holds, so you read it in St. Jerome, St. Augustine, Tertullian, it's confirmed twice in the Summa Theologica that Adam, before the fall, was shown the mystery of the Incarnation. This is maintained by St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, and others, I'm sure. Adam, when he was put in the mystical sleep, and Eve was formed from his side, was shown the mystery of Jesus, the Word made flesh, and his bride, the Church. And when he woke from the mystical sleep, this is why he saw such beauty in Eve, was because he represented Christ, Eve represented the Church, and he was ecstatic to see this beauty and that he was called to be sort of an icon, and she an icon, of the love between Christ and the Church. St. Jerome writes, the first prophet, Adam, prophesied this about Christ and the Church, that our Lord and Savior would have left his Father, God, and his Mother, the heavenly Jerusalem, that he would come down to earth for the sake of his body, the Church, that the Church would have been taken from his side and for her the Word would have been made flesh. This is before the fall. Adam knew about the Incarnation, about the love between Christ and his bride, the Church. Tertullian writes, What had Adam that was spiritual? Is it because he prophetically declared the great mystery of Christ and the Church? And he has a reference to Ephesians 5, verses 32. He says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Eve. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That's a reference, obviously, to Genesis 2, 22, 23 and 24. But this gift, Tertullian says, this gift of prophecy, uh, only came on him afterwards when God infused him into the ecstasy or that spiritual quality in which prophecy exists. There's another, I have another quote here from St. Thomas Aquinas, but you get the point that there's this tradition that before the fall, Adam 
and we would also say Eve, but Adam knew about the mystery of the Incarnation. He knew that we were called to be divinized uh, in Jesus Christ, to come to God through him. And so um, I, I want to quote, because I think many of you may be familiar with St. John Paul II. He had a whole series of teachings that they call the theology of the body, which I think is kind of a narrow like, way of speaking of it. He's talking about matrimony and the beauty of creation. But listen to what St. John Paul II, listen to what he writes. Before sin, before sin, this is St. John Paul II, before sin, man bore in his soul the fruit of eternal election in Christ, the eternal Son of the Father. You see why I'm quoting this, right? Before the fall, before sin, man bore in his soul the fruit of eternal election in Christ, the eternal Son of the Father, comparing the testimony of the beginning found in the first chapters of Genesis with the testimony of the letter to the Ephesians, one must deduce that the reality of man's creation was already imbued by the perennial election of man in Christ. This is before the fall. Man's creation was imbued with the perennial election that we have in Christ, he says. Man is called to sanctity through the grace of adoption as sons. He goes on, he says, man, male and female, shared from the beginning in this supernatural gift. This bounty was granted in consideration of him, of Christ. So the original innocence, the original justice, the original beauty of Adam and Eve was in view of, in consideration of the incarnation, of that wedding feast of the Lamb between Christ and his bride, the church. That's what St. John Paul II is saying. Now, I don't know if I put him to the test, are you following the Franciscan thesis, whether you would say yes, but what he's saying confirms what the Franciscans hold, that the universe is Christocentric, sin or no sin, the whole reason, raison d'être, as they say in French, the whole reason for everything is Jesus. Jesus is the reason. He's why we exist. He's why there's a sun, a moon, a Jupiter, anything else in the universe. It's because God saw Jesus. He willed his masterpiece and he created all of this to glorify him and through with and in him the Father, but also um, in view of Jesus. The reason everything exists is for Christ the King. So let's see here. Oh, so let me finish this quote of St. John Paul II. This supernatural endowment, which took place before original sin, that is, the grace of justice and original innocence, an endowment which was the fruit of man's election in Christ before the ages, was accomplished precisely in reference to him, to the beloved one, while anticipating chronologically his coming in the body. In the dimensions of the mystery of creation, the election to the dignity of adopted sonship was proper only to the first Adam, that is, to the man created in the image and likeness of God, male and female. So as you can see, there are abundant quotes, there's scripture quotes. I could tell you to look at Ephesians 1, where it talks about how before the foundations of the world, we were predestined in Christ to be God's adopted children, to be holy and unblemished, which also is immaculate in God's sight and love. I could refer you to Romans 8, verse 28, which says that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Now, if you know anything about firstborn, firstborn of all creation, that's Colossians 1, firstborn of many brethren. In order to be a brother, you have to share the same nature. So if we're predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, so that he could be the firstborn of many brethren, it means that we were predestined in Christ, the Word incarnate. If he was the firstborn of all creatures, that means to be the firstborn of all creatures, you have to be a creature. Like if you're the firstborn of a bunch of lambs, you must be a lamb. <laughs> you know? So 
Jesus. Now, let me just clarify one more thing, uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, go to some, some potential questions. Actually, I'll, I'll say a, something, a little something about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and then I'll go to questions. But let me just clarify something. One of the things that can, can, can get confusing about this is how can Jesus be the firstborn of all, creature, of all creatures, the firstborn of all creation, but he doesn't come till, you know, till like, what, you know, 4,000 years after creation? But he, he's called, the Bible calls him the firstborn of many brethren, the firstborn of all creatures. Jesus calls himself, this is uh, in Apocalypse 3, verse 14, he calls himself, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, how can Jesus be the beginning of the creation of God when he comes later? Well, you have to think, you have to think from God's perspective. So, um, let me start with this. Many people, I think most people here are familiar with a map. Uh, our youth are only familiar with GPS. But if you look at a map, if you look at a physical map, um, I can look at New York City and Los Angeles and see both of them because I'm not in the map. I can see them both. I can see Chicago and Dallas and Kansas and Paris and depends on how big the map is. But because I'm outside the map, I can see all of those things. Well, God is outside of time. God is outside of history. There's no beginning or end. There's no time in God. He's outside of time. He is above, transcends creation. So when he looks at the salvation history, he sees it all like I see Los Angeles and New York City on a map. So God can see the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, and say, this is the reason for everything. This is the beginning of creation. This is the firstborn of all creatures. And then he begins to create. The other way to explain this, um, let's see here. Okay, we do. We have a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That's perfect. So there's a beautiful wood carved statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now, if I wanted to carve a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, I already have the statue. I already have the masterpiece in my mind first. So what's first in the intention, in the mind, is last in the execution, right? Because what's first is the masterpiece, but what's, what's first on the chronological? I have to go cut down a tree, and I have to bring a hunk of wood into this beautiful hall and make a huge mess. Uh, and take off chunks and start to carve. So what is first in the intention, the masterpiece, the statue of the Sacred Heart, is actually the last chronologically. Like, I finish with the masterpiece. So in God's plan of salvation, what's first in God's intent, what's the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus Christ. True God, true man, Son of God the Father, Son of Mary, that's first in God's plan. That is his masterpiece. What's first in his intention comes later in the execution. In the fullness of time, he is born of the Virgin Mary. So hopefully that helps you to kind of grasp that. Um, and, and that was the argument that blessed John Dun Scotus used to defend and champion this position of the absolute primacy of Christ. So the Franciscan perspective is the primacy of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus is absolute. It's not dependent on anything created, not sin, nothing. God willed Jesus Christ with an absolute primacy in all the creation Christocentric, sin or no sin. It's not relative. The other perspective is a relative primacy of Christ. The word relative comes from relate. In other words, the primacy of Christ from this perspective, the Thomistic perspective, is that it's related to sin. It's related to a need. And so Jesus 
comes as the Redeemer, but if Adam had not sinned, and there's a bunch of saints that say this, if Adam hadn't sinned, there would be no incarnation. That sounds absurd, doesn't it? But, but, but yeah, I can quote St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Thomas Aquinas. So it, there's both doctors on both sides, um, and I'm obviously not in a debate, so I'm just presenting, I'm trying to represent both. That's one of the things, Franciscans always have to present both, whereas the Thomists can just say, oh, that was a stupid theory of the Franciscans. Because <laughs> they have St. Thomas, you know? I mean, they have the angelic doctor, you know? Uh, uh, I'm joking, but it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very true. So I want to say one thing um, that when I spoke about the, the dawn, about Joseph and then Mary and then Jesus, this is also going to be, I think, historically, the signs for the coming of Jesus in glory. I think there will be an age, an increased devotion, and it's beautiful because we're seeing some of that to St. Joseph. Um, it's a beautiful book by Father Calloway on consecration to St. Joseph. There's just an increase of devotion to St. Joseph, so like the white dawn. But before Jesus can come, Mary prophesied that in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. She said, my Immaculate Heart will be a refuge and a way to God for you. And so she wanted us and she wants us to come to her Immaculate Heart, to that refuge of her Immaculate Heart. So what I want to point out in kind of conclusion is uh, that this Jesus is the center, but he's also going to come in glory. And before he comes in glory, we are going to see a triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart. And this is one of those prophecies that Our Lady made that is unconditional. So there's two types of prophecies. Right? There's the conditional prophecy. Think of Jonah. Jonas, the prophet, went into Nineveh. He didn't want to go. You got to get swallowed by a whale first, remember? He eventually went, and he wasn't happy at how it turned out either. But Jonah prophesied that the city would be destroyed. Now, was the prophecy wrong? No, it was conditional. It's conditional. So, it was a conditional prophecy. So because of their prayer, their penance, their fasting, God mitigated, and in this case, he actually um, did not destroy Nineveh. So that's a conditional prophecy. Now, when Isaiah prophesied that a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a child, and he shall be called Emmanuel, that was unconditional. Whether Akaz wanted to hear it or not, Jesus is coming of the Virgin Mary, unconditional. Mary's prophecy that in the end my Immaculate Heart will triumph is an unconditional prophecy. It will happen. Her heart will triumph. But I want to point out a few things. At the Annunciation, well, let me start before that. At the Immaculate Conception, The Immaculate Conception. When God created Mary, she was free from all taint of sin. She was already all yes to God, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. At the moment of her Immaculate Conception, she was already, from the first beat of her heart, was all for God. She was crushing the head of Satan. She was triumphing. Her Immaculate Heart was triumphing in the womb of St. Anne. That includes today the birthday of Mary. Her Immaculate Heart starts to beat outside the womb, in this world, triumphing. Her Immaculate Heart at the Annunciation says yes to being the Mother of God, the Mother of the Messiah. Her Immaculate Heart obeys the words of the angel as opposed to Eve who disobeyed through a fallen angel. She obeys God's plan. Her Immaculate Heart triumphs and she becomes the Mother of God and Mother of us all who are uh, mystically united to Jesus through baptism, through the church. On Calvary, Our Lady renews her fiat. She renews her yes. She says yes, like Abraham said yes to offering Isaac, but obviously God stayed his hand. And then Abraham said those prophetic words that God will provide the lamb. 
reference to Jesus. Well, now the lamb was here, and Mary said yes, and on Calvary, by offering Jesus in her maternal, sorrowful heart to God in union with Jesus, she triumphs and crushes the head of Satan. Her immaculate and sorrowful heart triumphs. She is assumed body and soul into heaven. So literally, physically, Mary's heart is throbbing with love for each one of us in heaven. Her heart is triumphant. Her heart is triumphant in heaven. It's in glory. <clears throat> Satan never has and never will have anything on Mary. She is victorious, Our Lady of Victory. <clears throat> she is crowned queen by the Most Holy Trinity. She is triumphing. So her immaculate heart has triumphed. So now, come back full circle, what does Mary mean? In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph if her heart is already triumphant. Well, the answer is pretty simple. I don't read the newspaper or watch any news shows, but I don't have to watch them to know that if you watch a half-hour news program, it's very clear that the Immaculate Heart of Mary hasn't triumphed in our lives, in our world, in our hearts. So what she's saying is, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph in the world, in our hearts, in our lives, in our spiritual lives. And that means that we can do something about it. We can help bring about the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart because it happens one heart at a time. And that's why I go to confession so often, because sometimes the Immaculate Heart of Mary hasn't yet triumphed fully in my life, and I want it to. So I go to confession, and I keep renewing that consecration. I keep praying that rosary, holding Our Lady's hand, uh, so that she can, her Immaculate Heart can triumph in my heart and through me in the hearts of others. So that's it. We have to consecrate ourselves to Mary. We have to live that consecration. And then we have to spread that consecration. We have to bring other souls to their mother Mary. Jesus said on the cross, behold your mother. So when everyone lives as a child of Mary, we're speaking of a triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart, and that's like the beautiful dawn, isn't it? If we lived in a world where everybody loved Mother Mary and loved one another, does that mean that we don't sin, that we're not, we don't have imperfections? No. Like, oh, this is a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We went to Mass, and you're listening to a talk about Jesus. You could be doing a lot of other things Friday night in Manhattan. This is a triumph. And yet, all of us know that we're sinners. We all do the mea culpa at Mass. But this is what the triumph is. It's where we say, Mary... You're my mother, take me as your child. I throw myself in your arms. At Bethlehem, Jesus was born, placed in a manger between an ox and ass, adored by shepherds and kings, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus Christ.
Oh 